haven't recorded this yet. So um, now I'm on record. So now I don't know whether I can tell you an off color joke or not, because, you know, in this <laughs> day and age, you're not supposed to, you know, do stupid jokes like that. It's not everybody has the same sense of humor. Nobody ever did. I didn't think it was that off colored. I mean, it's not like something that somebody could get sued for over harassment or anything. No, no. But you know. I wouldn't think. But you know, yeah, you never know. Now everybody's <laughs> now everybody's worried. What is this joke about? What is he gonna say? What terrible thing is Mr. Fritz gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> it was just gross. It's, it's a really old it's a really old joke about art and art artists so basically what's the difference between a sculptor and a painter and this is told you know at parties where sculptors and painters are um so anyway and i'll have to explain the joke too but maybe not to you guys uh, the difference between a sculptor and a painter is that the painter takes the dishes out of the sink before he pees in it or she pees in it. Um, basically, um, the, the painter is always a little bit more sophisticated. The painter you know, has a little bit nicer studio. The painter usually washes their dishes and gets them out of the sink. But both the painter and the sculptor are the kind of people that would pee in the sink. Um, because, you know, we are just all about getting something um, done really quick and then moving on. And so that leg is going to go that way. And this part of this leg is going to go back behind it. So again, another extreme bend. This person was a dancer and had bendy limbs and could get into pretzels. And one of the things that I like to study are kind of a, an approach to the human figure as a pretzel. Um, you know, there's, there's this old saw that people always, um, uh, hit me with when I was in grad school about, you know, the figure has been done to death. You know, the human figure has been done by humans for 20,000 years now, and it's, it's completely passe and it's been totally done to death. And, you know, I guess, you know, that's kind of true. And at the same time, it's not. And, um, there's nothing new. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. Abstraction has been always done and over and over and done to death too. And so these guys thought that abstraction was, you know, this sacred, wonderful thing. And I'm here to tell you that it's all kind of sacred and wonderful, the kinds of things that we do. So this arm comes out of here, but this arm is going to be, have another triangle and this arm comes back into the hair near the head. And so eventually I'm gonna to have to get a head in here sideways over this way and an arm and then another arm that comes off the back. It's a reclining figure, it's all akimbo. It's a very contemporary kind of a reclining figure. And we'll see if I can actually make this work or not. Um, let's see. So I've, in the original sculpture, I had this great big, wonderful long uh, hair kind of coming down in tresses. And now I have to chop this all off and re-sculpt the hair once I get the head into the orientation and space that I want it to be in. So I have to change angles of neck and stuff and then reapply and get the head to sit kind of at the angle that we're gonna want it to be at and then bring in the arms to do with the army thing. Okay, and so at the elbow, I get to make a joint. Let's see, which way is this gonna go? Like that. It's really interesting when the teacher starts getting lost in his own sculpture. And you guys are wondering, what the hell is he going to teach us today? Is he going to say anything? Is he going to teach us anything today? That's a good question. Sculpture is a really um, solitary kind of thing, experience. And sometimes there's not much I can teach you. It's, it's everything that we are trying to do together. Okay, that's good. I'm going to take one of these hands because I've already got some pre-made hands that have all fallen apart and gotten smashed up so that they get to all get fixed up. 
individually re-sculpted. But at least I've got a hand form here that is the right size and uh, scale to go along with this figure so that all I have to do is kind of reposition the hand and I'm gonna kind of cut the fingers apart so that I can pose the fingers. You know, in many ways, it's kind of like working with a Barbie doll because you do get this thing that is posable. And then at the same time, you're gonna actually, <laughs> you're gonna build it. I mean, you're kind of making this person, this figure from scratch and it is very unique and it's your own sculpture. So I'm going to kind of pose this into um, sort of a relaxed fist kind of form and then add that to the end of the wrist and see how it works. I have a quick question. There's no such thing as a quick question. You say it's a quick question, but I will kind of, you know. It's a, it's a pretty quick question. Do you prefer James, <laughs> do you prefer Fritz or do you prefer something more formal? I am not, I'm not formal. Um, um, he usually likes Jimothy. No, I'm a, I like James and I've had this, this Christian guy who I, you know, I respect his name, but you know, he always wants to poke the bear all the time. I got one guy in this class who likes to poke the bear. Um, but I like James. Uh, you don't have to call me Herr Professor Dr. Fritz. That's not, that's not a thing that I, I need. Um, but, you know, I've been this young, youthful um, art teacher forever now. And I find that, oh, I'm not that 30-year-old guy anymore, am I? I'm now that grizzled 60-year-old guy trapped inside, you know, or, you know, the, I'm the 17 year old trapped inside the body of the 60 year old guy. Um, so you don't have to stand on ceremony or anything. So this, this hand comes right up and kind of caresses the forehead. And it might even come up at an angle. We'll just try to see how that works. And it's going to get, it's going to get fingers and all kinds of other stuff. And so I have to figure out, I have to reconnect this arm to this shoulder and build a new deltoid muscle for it. And this does come together at a pretty tight angle like this. Okay, and sometimes you gotta smash the wax together to get it go. So that's that. And then the only thing I don't know is what happens with this hand on the other side because I can't see that in the photograph. So I'm assuming that this hand uh, is gonna go down here and probably hook up and link up to this foot here and just kind of capture the foot and grab it. And so that's probably gonna be the pose. And if, you've, if you're tired of seeing that, I'm gonna change camera angles so we can see it from the side because it's a little bit more interesting as this kind of uh, landscape of body forms um, rolling and cascading, sometimes a reclining figure that's laying down flat and all you're dealing with are the, the forms of, you know, hips and abs and, and rib cage and stuff like that becomes a very much um, landscape oriented form and not just a figurative form. So sometimes it's really fun with the reclining figures to kind of push that um, possibility of it being horizontal um, and a landscape, but I digress, so. I'm going to come back up here to yet another well, angle. Well, I, well, I got the weld. I actually you, had to m improvise and do add a little extra wax and make it weld into a solder, but I got it. I only dripped hot wax on my hand once, so we're good. <laughs> so what, how, how did you do it? What are you using as a heat <laughs> I, I set I set that the butter knife that you gave us I said I have a propane stove, uh, propane range. So I just set it on the uh, burner just so the tip was like exposed to the blue flame. And, you know, just sat it there for about 10 seconds while I prepped a parchment paper over a plate with a statue. And then I grabbed it and then it was just kind of dabbing it in there like you were doing with yours. And the, at one point I went all the way through and I had a hole I could see from the other side. So that's where the soldering came in. But so... It, it's pretty solid now, though, so uh, I'm happy with it. Well, that sounds good. That is, that's good. I'm glad that was successful. Um, 
you want to maybe not do too much soldering or welding um, with your stove because it'll make a mess on your stove and then your um, your housemates will be really mad at you that there's this stinky, nasty, smelly, smoky thing that's emanating from the burner until it completely burns off again. But yeah. you can get by with a few a few little welds um, off of your stove. That That probably will work. Well, I also have a pin torch. It's basically what you have, except a lot smaller. Okay. So that that word w- would have worked too. I just, I I mean, I set up a whole like station over there for surgery. You know? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I've got. Um, I'm going to come back to this other view again. I'm going to do a whole bunch of welding right now because um, I pretty much set this up pretty close to what the actual um pose is and i think i'm just gonna bring this back um arm in a lot more and squish this all together and then i'm gonna go around and just weld a whole bunch of joints together to try to bring all of these things together so some people like to wet like to sculpt in pieces and parts and then put the pieces and parts together and many of you have been you know kind of approaching this as individual elements of a sculpture that you're combining together and so i'm just kind of going around and i'm touching each joint with the knife blade to kind of weld that joint i'm only on there for a second or so just long enough to get a little bit of wax melted and flowing into the joint but I want to get right back off of it again so that it will um, it will stay and stick together. And so I'm just kind of going around. I'm also trying to not get my, my hand in that flame because that would suck. <laughs> that would be bad. I'm going to try to weld these fingers to this forehead. You know, you never know. So, um, is that... No, I've got the wrong hand on there. I put the right hand on the left arm or something. God, am I stupid. Okay, so I got to put this hand on there. Somehow I wound up with three hands with this sculpture. So this hand's got to come off. And this is the actual hand. The thumb goes down. The pinky finger goes up. You know, I've been doing this forever. You'd think that I would remember how this stuff works by now. But, you know. Even the professionals make mistakes. So a follow up question. Like uh so the 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 figure you got in front of you, uh, as an example, how would you get how would you like press and roll the wax into the the really acute angles like the underneath the chin or or the inside of that? right legs thigh or you know the create yeah, how would you get really the smooth it out on the inside there i have a tool but even with the tool it's it's really hard to press and well i i'm trying to pre pre-warm my wax so i've got my hot box on with the lamp over it and that's off camera and so i've got warmed wax i can also just take pick up a piece of wax and kind of squish it between my thumb and forefinger and roll it and you know create a little what I call a it's almost like a welding rod or a little filler rod it looks like a mouse turd basically if you can see this mouse turd (laughs) on my fingertip and then I can just lay the mouse turds in there and I can either weld them (laughs) into those joints or I can just I can lay it in there and then I can blend it with my fingertips when I weld them then they become structural and they They flow into the joint and they freeze off and they become a really good structural weld. And if all I'm trying to do is after I've welded these joints is fill them in to to complete the the transitions for that that space, then I can just, I can wipe warmed wax in there that came out of the, the hot box or from underneath my armpit or something like that and just kind of model with the wax at that point. So those are the two ways I'm doing it. I'm going to take this this mouse turd and actually build a thumb out of it so that I have a thumb form on my left hand. Didn't even address my question. Because I'm supposed to do that. Uh, Did that answer it? 
kind of. I'm going to put this left hand on there where the other wrong hand was on and then keep going. So I have to try to take this hand and again, bend it maybe into a kind of a loose open fist. And so this weekend is the weekend I'm supposed to run back up to Corvallis and get the Italian motorcycle, the Ducati, the stupid bike that I bought and pick that up and bring it home. And so I've got to do that on Saturday. I'm thinking that somehow on Saturday, I'm going to be between um, rainstorms and snowstorms. Wish me luck on that. But I think that that's how that's going to work out. Yeah, my best friend who's um, up at OSU, it's snowing like crazy over there. And then like here, it's been raining like crazy. So yeah, maybe you get maybe you'll get hail, the perfect mix of both. <laughs> well, these storms are supposed to taper off uh, tomorrow and it, it should start to clear off, you know, tomorrow evening and then Friday is supposed to be a clear day. The only problem is that the next storm coming in behind it is coming in on Saturday. But I think that it's going to come in around noon on Saturday. I've got my fingers all crossed. And I probably shouldn't be saying this out loud because that will jinx it for me and everybody else. But if that's the case, I can probably dash up there, pick up the bike before 10 o'clock on Saturday morning and bring it on into um, uh, Portland to the Ducati dealer where they're going to say, you know, why don't you just open up your bank account and give it to us and then we'll fix your bike. I've been researching the problem with the bike and uh, it's, it's common to a lot of bikes. A lot of guys talk about it on Ducati forums and stuff like that. You know, the Ducati is this beautiful engineering marvel and this design, this beautiful design, but like all Italian things, you know, like Lamborghinis and, you know, Maseratis and stuff like that. Um, it's a maintenance nightmare because, because, because they design for beauty and for the aesthetic, but they don't design for, um, you know, performance and, and maintenance over the long haul. So I found out that the brake system what is installed right next to the exhaust and, um, the catalytic converter. And so the catalytic converter gets up to 500 degrees and then it kind of cooks the brake line right next to it, which puts air into the system and um, moisture into the system over time. And that's why the Ducati brakes are a problem on the rear brakes of the motorcycle. Go figure. Was somebody asking about tools to get into little tight spaces? Yes. Yeah, I was trying to figure out how to get real up in the real where your fingers are too big areas. I have one of these things I've been using. Let me and I was sitting here thinking, but you know, that little curved end on there, you could probably use a fingernail clipper. I mean, anything you could find in the house that you don't mind sacrificing. Yeah. Uh, maybe even I, just a pair of fingernail clippers, that little hooked in, that might get in there. I love this like, little needle tool that he gave us. Yeah, that works good too, I think. So the needle I ended tool, up buying. Sorry. What's that, Christian? Where are you? Uh, I ended up buying a set of, um, well, I, I think they're technically carving tools, but like they honestly just look like a bunch of dental utensils. Mm -hmm. But they seem to work really well for all sorts of little things like that. Yeah, um, at Oregon Tool, you know, they sell these little things in stainless steel kits of four or five or six of them in an envelope. And some of them are bent and all, they kind of look like a dental tool, but they're just a little bit more blunt than a dental tool. And so that's, that's kind of a cute little tool. If you have a nut pick in your junk drawer, um, my folks back in the 1960s had a nut pick <laughs> in the drawer because they actually bought nuts in the shell and we would, we had a nutcracker. So we would crack nuts and then we'd pick the walnuts out of the shell. And so these little tiny nut picks can be a wonderful sculpting tool too. Um, I saw a chat thing fly by. Okay, no problem. 
What do you mean? Okay. What do you mean by walnuts in the shell? We had to pick them up out of the orchard and dry them. Really? Did you did you roast oh them? Did you gosh. roast chestnuts? No, walnuts. Our our hands would be like black from the peel on them, the tannic. Oh yeah. And it was always cold and snowing this time of year or earlier. Maybe it was fall. I don't know. I was a little kid. We had a walnut orchard. And we picked them up and we dried them and used them. So did you like walnuts when you were a kid? Yeah. Okay. And when you were kind of eating the walnuts, um, did you ever just like uh, take shelled walnuts and fry them in a pan with butter or anything or roast them somehow? No, no. They were usually, usually we ended up having to crack them at a certain point in time after they dried, we'd crack them and store them or they would get stored in the shell and we used them in baking. Okay cinnamon rolls, stuff like that. Well, it, for my keto diet, I eat a lot of walnuts. I have walnuts on just a green salad and stuff like that. But sometimes for a snack, I'll even just fry them up in a frying pan in butter and just heat them up a little bit. And the butter makes them taste really good. It's the keto diet. So you can eat as much fat as you want, as long as you're not eating any sugar. So um, uh, I always thought that walnuts were a little on the bitter side, but when you fry them in the pan, you can kind of convert some of them into something maybe a little bit sweeter. Um, so they, and maybe, or maybe it's just the butter, but anyway, <laughs> butter makes everything taste better, even walnuts. Kind of like bacon, huh? <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, bacon. I can't deal with bacon anymore. I'm sorry. Um, I don't usually buy it. I just get the like this Oscar Mayer recipe pieces because I don't use that much of it. And it's just like, you need a little bit for this or that. It's really easy. No mess. I'm guessing you're eating the wrong, wrong uh, bacon. If anything, Jim. Christian, do you like bacon? Are you a big bacon I, guy? Do you like I, turkey I, bacon? I used to hate it, really. Um, but my girlfriend, she always got thick cut bacon and uh, oh, that shit's good. we just pan fry it. And I don't know, I, I went from like hating bacon to absolutely loving it. And I don't know, I, I've definitely completely changed my mind. And I think it was just because all my life I was either given like bacon that was flimsy and you know like limp like a noodle or like <laughs> charcoal bacon like, I think that's why I hated it so much so yeah I hate greasy it has to be crisp and it can't be really greasy like one of the best breakfasts that I've like that I learned how to make um is just like a bagel a toasted bagel with like butter and then bacon and then a scrambled egg on top of that and a little bit of avocado if I have it. It's the best breakfast sandwich ever. It makes my whole day when I do those. Ooh. And if you get a cold, throw a handful of pickled nacho jalapenos on there. That'll kick it in the butt. It's good. Cheese and egg. Or not. Are, are we trying to make each other hungry? Like, Well, I have a bacon story, but it's completely different. Um, I'm I'm a 4-H leader for shooting sports. I've done archery and um, small bore rifle and pistol. And so I got nominated uh, to be the statewide coach for the team going to nationals in Nebraska. And one of the kids who qualified for nationals from up in the Corvallis area happens to be from a very devout Muslim family. And there are all kinds of issues why the family didn't want her to go. Um, and it's not fair and it's not nice, but you know, because she's a daughter and their son was a little younger and, and she and would be like upstaged by the performance of the daughter. They didn't want the daughter to go 
to this national competition. But I found out that there was a whole bunch of other stuff too. Um, and bacon is kind of part of it. To take a team to Nebraska for a week to compete, you're going into like the heart of bacon country. And so everything- It's pure. Pardon? It's because it's not pure, right? Yeah, it's not on their on the menu. It's the, you yeah. know, they have a real similar uh, dietary laws and customs to uh, the Jewish faith. And so, yeah, you can't, they, they can't eat pork of any kind. And so, you know, it's on, it's everywhere, you know, it's on pizza and it's a breakfast food and it's all over the place. And they were really concerned that this poor kid would be taken out for dinners and stuff, breakfast, and couldn't find anything that she could eat on the menu because it was pork <laughs> because it's the middle of the Midwest and the pork producer eating potatoes, <laughs> the eating wrong potatoes. yeah American food but there's other stuff to take you know to take a 16 year old um, uh, Muslim girl who is wearing a headscarf to a national competition and to have her endure the slings and arrows of people who don't like her don't appreciate her and um you know, all of that, it's, again, it's a different kind of prejudice, but it's, um, it's so fun, fair. it's no fun for the kid, and it's no fun for the coach either to have to deal with that. It's really a shame, because, like, she has to have immense skill in order for her to, like, qualify to go to nationals, but can't because of bigotry or possibly having, or other things going on of I agree with you on that. It's tragic. Yeah, and me as a as the 4-H leader, I mean, I have to respect the family and try to work with the family and their expectations because we're all about youth development. And so it's not like I can tell the parents, you know, to not worry about this stuff or that kind of thing. Um, and she has competed before during the month of Ramadan. Um, the month of Ramadan kind of moves around the calendar because um, their months are kind of uh, based on a lunar calendar. So they're only 27 uh, days long instead of 30 and 31 days long. But um, like two summers ago, it was still the month of Ramadan and they were fasting all day long and they could only you know, eat before sunrise and after sundown. And during the daytime, the kids can only drink like tea and so she's drinking tea and, you know, out in the sunshine competing all day long. And so to do it under those kinds of circumstances and still win is, is really cool. I mean, it's really a feather in her cap. Um, so uh, now that the pandemic is almost over and we're thinking about being able to restart this thing and go back this summer, I'm gonna see once again, if I can get the father to maybe allow me to take the daughter to, to Nebraska to compete if I can, you know, show respect for the family and the family's traditions and, um, you know, be a good chaperone and make sure that nothing happens to, you know, her, the daughter, but to be able to make sure that her dietary needs are taken care of and she can still compete in rifle at, a, at the national level. It's like, it's hell, but it, it's a kind of an interesting hell to try to deal with. And I don't know, I may have a veteran in the class or two that have served in Iraq or Afghanistan, and you probably have little or no patience for this story at all. And I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, and on the other hand, these guys are immigrants to this country and they're trying to do the assimilation into America. But at the same time as first generation immigrants, they are still really bound to their, um, their religious faith and their customs from where they came from. And uh, I, as the 4-H leader, I'm always caught in the middle because I have to respect where the family's coming from. <sighs> so there's all of that. <laughs> it's a minefield. It's fraught with all kinds of issues. So I don't know, I, when I was in college, um, I'm sorry, in graduate school, um, I, we used to hang out with the, um, the metalsmiths who made jewelry because there was a master's degree program in metalsmithing. It was really similar to sculpture. 
And so we often, you know, drank together and partied at night and stuff like that. And one of the metalsmiths had a line of jewelry that he was making that he called roadkill jewelry because he would run it through a um, some kind of a press and make little tire tracks across the earrings and stuff so that it looked like you know a, t- a car had run over it uh, with with tire marks and stuff like that. And I was making sculptures that were reclining figures like this occasionally that looked like they had been run over or hit by a car out on the road. And I always thought about doing a uh, you know, a a series of roadkill sculpture um, that kind of looked like, you know, nude figures had been run over by a truck or a car or something like that. But, you know, you think it's a great idea and it's super avant-garde and everything, but it's the kind of thing that pisses everybody off because, you know, it's very offensive. It's, it's, um, you know, using brutality and uh, uh, violence against women, especially the nude uh, figure and all of that. So I never did do um, any roadkill sculpture, but this sculpture form sitting on the table in front of me reminded me of that graduate school experience. Art is fraught with danger. It's, there's all kinds of ways you can get into trouble as an artist. So what do you guys think of all of this so far, of the class, of the idea that we meet for, you know, I don't know, an hour or so from six to seven o'clock, and then I turn you loose uh, to sculpt and leave you up to your own devices. Are you getting your work done um, when you're up, when you're doing it on your own, or do you just kind of, is it better to have, you know, the zoom on and me talking because then it gives you a reason and a kind of impetus to work on your stuff and get it done. I know I have not been getting much sculpture done when I'm not with you guys. Um, I don't sit down and get this done on my own and yet we're supposed to be getting in about six hours of seat time every week. And I know Paula and Zoe are probably getting it in because they not are really artists. What? <laughs> Very much so not. Uh, for me, um, when the pandemic hit, uh, I, for some odd reason, stopped making art almost entirely outside of cl- class, and so it it's still been like really hard to like make art outside of a classroom setting. Oh, so, yeah. Well, this this is good to know. Maybe this is you know it's kind of structured and therapeutic to have the damn Zoom on so that we we are forced <laughs> to do this together and try to find some kind of a, a rhythm to get back into uh, of personal work. Um, I haven't done a lot of sculpture either. With the pandemic, I got into motorcycles and house maintenance and all kinds of other little projects, but I got out of a lot of rhythms. I'm not doing the 4-H thing anymore because 4-H has been totally shut down for the last nine months. Um, I started doing 4-H with the national team on the sly. I didn't ask anybody's permission. We got together at somebody's, at one of the kids' parents' farm up near Corvallis, and we we do our shooting practice up there. Um, But if I had asked for permission, they would have said no. So, you know, sometimes you got to do something and, and just ask for forgiveness later on instead of ask for permission in the beginning. For me, it was easier in class because everything else is just turned off. When I'm at home and I'm trying to do this, the dog does something or the phone rings or I have to go to the store or I stop for lunch. And if I was at the campus, I wouldn't do that. I would just focus on this Mm -hmm. for the whole time that we were supposed to be doing it. But at home, it's like I take the dog out, then I come back, then I've got to get, get the wax warm again and it just, it's easy to put it off sometimes. I see. Well, for me, I have some problems getting started too, but then I spent, I probably spent a couple hours doing research, figuring it out. Oh, that's good. And then like my, one of my things is that like my brain tends to compartmentalize for different things. So like when I'm at home, I'm at home. When I'm at work, I'm at work. And when I'm at school, I'm in school mode. 
And so like the very beginning of the pandemic was really difficult because like suddenly I had to do school at home and that did not compute at all. (laughs) (laughs) I was both lucky and unfortunate to be an essential worker. So Mm. I at least had that, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to pause right here because another thing that I ran into in graduate school an awful lot was um, I was the only figurative, naturalistic figurative person working in my program and everybody else was doing very various kinds of abstraction. And they were always telling me to get beyond, you know, the figure and find ways to abstract it and that kind of thing. Well, here's one of those ways of abstracting. I mean, I could leave this sculpture in some kind of state like this where you've got all of the joints exposed and none of the transitions you know re re, uh, sculpted completely and this is interesting to me intellectually but it doesn't um it doesn't compute for me um aesthetically i mean i really like the well integrated naturalistic representational human figure um, I've d- I did these, uh, I did some of these like this in grad school and cast them in bronze and I exhibited them and they didn't really get anybody terribly excited. People who didn't like the figure didn't like the segmented abstracted figure either. And, you know, then people who didn't like my figures didn't like my, my naturalistic representational figures either. So you can't please anybody um, in the arts. You pretty much have to please yourself. Um, but it's, it is an interesting, I don't know, it's interesting to deal with this stuff because, uh, there are tastes in art and movements in art and everybody, you know, has some, is a stakeholder someplace in this process. So I thought I was a good feminist when I was, um, doing these sculptures because I always thought that I was, um, you know, being respectful and trying to go for the dignity and uh, some kind of transcendent spiritual quality for my figures. But the feminists didn't like my work either because I was a male doing the female figure. And so I was suspect and I was dirty and wrong and shouldn't be doing that. So I, I could not, uh, I could not win at that game at all. And um, you do run into your critics about, you um, about art and your aesthetic choices. And I suppose if I had become the guy who did triangles and made sculptures that were all about triangles, that would have been better because you can't really piss off people when you're making triangles. (laughs) I know a couple Zelda fans that might beg to differ. So I've got this thing roughed out and I'm going to now be spending about 10 hours on this sculpture in the refining process and the sculpting process, trying to get this to work more like the original pose and the photograph that I've got. And the person was really, really tiny, skinny, you know, size one person. So I'm going to probably be carving lots and lots off of this. Um, and I know I could have, I could have other aesthetics informing my work so I could work with, um, models that are real and, um, you know, naturalistic and more representative in size and shape of real people. Um, and I hung out with a lot of folks that were doing that as part of their feminist approach to sculpture, um, um, you know, well-proportioned, um, uh, figurative sculpture um, that was not about the uh, the kind of the traditional proportions of um, body and body self-image in America. And that wasn't my aesthetic either. So, you know, they went their way and we, and I went my way. We can, you know, talk about those things and examine those things as ideas and aesthetics. But ultimately at the end of the day, you kind of have to follow your own uh, muse and do what's what's right for you.
but it's been a, it's also been a great big journey because in in um, in just teaching at the college level, I've had to try to grow an awful lot and learn a lot of things because you know we've become more and more um, sensitive to um, uh, all kinds of gender issues uh, in the classroom, um, you know, non-binary uh, things as well as um, uh, you know, a whole spectrum of, you know, sexuality and everything else. And so um, it's a steep learning curve for old farts like me, um, but it's also really good for us to deal with these things and grow with it and, uh, and learn from it too. So we try to become better, you know, and more sensitive about this stuff, just in general in the classroom. So we can be better advocates for our students because I have to advise you guys and, um, you know, try to help you in your next uh, phases in life and uh, steps and where you're going for education and your development. And I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate for students. I want you guys to succeed. I want you guys to learn as much as you can from me. I want you to be successful out there as artists. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm dog sitting and all three of them decided, let's jump on Zoe right now. While she's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I didn't realize I had my microphone still on. <laughs> Dogs are good. I love dog sitting because I love dogs, but only other people's dogs. <laughs> Because I have they're... people that adopted my hound and they ended up having to put her down and instead of getting another dog, they've been borrowing their friend's dog and taking it for hikes. Yeah, because with other people's dogs, at the end of the day, they're not your responsibility. <laughs> That's what's great. Like, I love hanging out with these three, but I don't want to be their person forever. I also like this person that I had like house sit and dog sit for. She also has goats and they're very fun to visit. I would not want to do this all the time every day though. <laughs> I am much too disorganized. Me and my cat avoid each other all day and then he yells at me when he's hungry and we're good. Like <laughs> we sometimes he decides to sit down with me while I do my homework and we chill. I like it. <laughs> I don't think I'll get another dog. My guy's getting pretty old and it's just sometimes it's like, nah, I don't want to do this again. Plus it's hard to go anywhere. I have to get a dog sitter if it's hot out or whatever. It's kind of a pain in the neck too. Now I'm doing what you guys have to do, you know, what we all have to do. I'm holding the sculpture upside down and welding the backsides of all of my welds and working with gravity sometimes to get those welds welded. So I have to tip it and roll it so that it can get welded. And so sculpting is just fraught with danger and excitement. As long as up here, I'm going to do this arm because it's got lots of pieces on the back that need welding. And of course, when you look at it from the underside that you haven't addressed or touched at all, nothing makes sense because it all just is a mess. So I've got lots of sculpting out ahead of me. But anyway, that was an interesting piece to get started. If I uh, if I hopped off, do I lose my attendance for the day? No, you're good to go. You're all checked in. Do what you need to do. Um, thanks for being here. And in yeah. fact, we're probably going to wrap this up pretty soon because even though you like being with me and I like being with you, we probably can't be sculpting on Zoom for hours at a time. <laughs> 
So take off, Zach. Or um, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. You have a good night. Okay. And, you know, anybody else, if you need to get going because you've got other homework and that kind of stuff, that's great. Try, try, try to schedule some part of your day or weekend in for sculpting. I usually like to listen. I'm a, I, I listen to the radio. I'm a public radio guy. And so um, I usually like to get up early in the morning and I listen to two hours of like morning edition. And that's a great time for... Um, for painting or sculpting or getting your um, some kind of a daily routine of working in. Um, I learned this in grad school that there are times in your day where if you can turn on the, the music or turn on the news or something that's in the background that is good for you, that fills your soul, that whatever, and then you can do it at the same time every day um, that's good. And some people like to get up and sculpt or paint, you know, at five in the morning and they'll work through until about nine o'clock in the morning and then put it away for the day and get their day started, um, make breakfast, go to work, whatever. So sometimes finding that time of day that works best into the rest of your schedule and doing it on a daily basis as a routine, um, is often a, a great way to build in work into your schedule on a daily basis for art. It's hard to find time for, but um, you know, it's almost like a religion. You know, if it's part of a daily, or it's a, uh, what is that stuff that you do? Uh, yoga and meditation. It's a daily meditation. A uh, pardon? A ritual? It's a ritual, yes. And when you can build ritual into your life, it becomes, it becomes important to you. It also becomes a habit, a habit of mind and body. And, you know, also like, um, like yoga and meditation, it just can become a really good thing for you uh, to do. So I, I look at making sculpture like that. I have my maker's table set up and I can go to it and work there. And I, I, myself, I just, I turn on public radio, Jefferson Public Radio, and I listen to that for two hours and I just veg out and make sculpture. And the time just, um, I, I zone out and I get into a state of flow and then I don't even, I'm out of time. I'm not a time person anymore when I'm making art. And that's kind of wonderful. And you remember how that works, Zoe, before the pandemic started? Have you seen that new movie, Soul, yet? So now I just zone out all the time, and it's like, oh, it's already three o'clock? Whoops. <laughs> and I'm not even making anything. I'm just, like, sitting there or doing something, and it's, it's weird. So I, post on I have a life. question really quick. Yeah. Um... This is actually Hunter. I'm at, I've been like, are we graded on attendance? Um, sort of. I mean, it's kind of a combination of attendance and or um, time on task. So um, we're trying to put in six hours of seat time on this project. That's two, three hour sessions, you know, in the classroom uh, a week. But um, it would be nice if you can at least uh, check into this thing um, to get... Uh, that attendance. Now, if you are busy, if you have a work conflict or something else, just let me know so that I know that you can't make, you know, these meetings all the time, but no, that it, you're working on stuff on your own. I've actually just, because my apartment's pretty crowded, I've been going to Jordan's house and I've been, I've been here, but just not on my computer, you okay. know, like on the same computer. So I just didn't know if I was like getting docked, even though if I was here. No, I mean, um, I kind of keep track of this stuff so that if somebody just stops coming to class or just really can't come up with any kind of sculpture after five or six weeks, you know, there's a correlation between um, whether folks are, you know, coming on a regular basis or not. But um, are, you, are you signed in as yourself today or are you signed in on Jordan's computer? 
Me and, me and uh, Jordan are sitting right next to each other. I've been just going to his house using his computer. We've been just watching the class. Okay, over. thanks. Over. That's good. I did need to know that. That's good. Thanks for telling me. Okay. Yeah. So who are you again? <laughs> I'm. This is Van Curler. Van Curler. Okay, I know you. Hunter, the other Hunter, thanks for coming. Nice to see yeah. you. Glad to know that you're checking in. I appreciate that. That's yeah. good. Yeah, I felt bad because I hadn't said anything. Okay. So, so um, have you come up with a uh, sculptural form that you're working on? Do you have a composition or something that you're kind of working on? That Because um, I've tried to write down for most people the, the project that they're working on. Do you, do you have something that is kind of coalescing out of the mists of wax? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. It hasn't been going great. I don't really, I just kind of started making shape until something came along. So I've kind of got a, a decent looking stump and I'm going to stick an ax out of it. Okay, so far we got a stump with an ax possibly. I'm just going to make a, a note of that. But I, I'm, I want to rush in and say it's okay. Don't worry about it. But I was also playing with the early in the early weeks of this thing with something as mundane and funny and stupid as this little cat, which I'm still working on on the sides. Um, so even on, and you were here before in, in another class. So you remember us doing a small critter. I'm trying to steer people away from the sea turtles because I've cast a buttload of sea, sea turtles in my life and I don't want to do any more sea turtles, but you know, cats, frogs, something fun, something small. Something like this, you know, it fits in the palm of your hand. It only takes a dollar or two of bronze for something like this. It's the kind of thing you can give away to a significant other. And it's it's a quickie. So sometimes no. these little- How about things, a mermaid? How about a mermaid? <laughs> a mermaid is the best of both worlds. You get the human figure and you don't have to do with those <laughs> scary bits down below the waist. <laughs> No, I'm actually terrible at this. And I started trying to make an animal and then it just became so bad that I just clumped it all together and made a stone. Okay. All right. Well, I, I, I can understand. I hear your frustration <laughs> and I don't want to lose you just on account of frustration. So you know, try to keep going with it. We're good. Okay. I'll, I'll finish this probably by tonight and then I'll start. I'll just try to copy what you just showed me. Okay, well, you don't have to copy it, but you know, I was using, um, you know, search terms on a Google image search, um, bronze sculpture, and then I was looking at cute little kitty cats, bronze sculpture, and it's just amazing because there's so many pieces out there that give me ideas, and so I was looking for something, um, anything, and you can fill in any other kind of search term for bronze sculpture and see what, you know, get, you know, a hundred different variations on a theme to see what you like. So if you like dogs or cats or frogs or rabbits or something, um, it's really cool and it's out there. The smaller animals seem to be easier to sculpt than the bigger animals with longer legs. Um, deer, elk um, are problematic because they're big and um, charismatic megafauna are a little bit more difficult to sculpt. For some reason, the smaller mammals are a little bit more approachable uh, in a lot of ways. And they're, they seem formally to be a little bit easier to sculpt too. So it's an idea. Um, okay. uh, I will note that. And okay. so how, ma how many more days or weeks do we have until I have to turn this in? Because I'm pretty sure I'm almost done with this ugly stump thing. So I'll just start on a little bit. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm thinking we've got um, between one and two more weeks of doing this. Um, some people who are going to get done a little bit early can start bringing pieces in next week, especially towards the end of next week. For us, the end of the week is Wednesday, you know. Um, next week is week five, and then the following week is week six of the quarter. And so if you can wrap something up in the next two or three weeks, that would be fine. Uh, I'm going to take the early pieces and start processing them so that uh, I can get some things cast. And then anything that comes in a little bit later, I'm going to push through as a second, um, a second flight of patterns going through the process. And they may get cast a week or a week and a half later than the first round. And that way I can get some people grinding and polishing on stuff while others are still kind of working on the casting 
process with me. So that's kind of how things are going to go as we transition in week six and seven from sculpting to processing this through the casting process. Oh. One of the one of the things that you that you've told us before, and I think it was in figure sculpture, um, was using a picture or knowing the muscle groups. I found a picture with the muscles attached to the skeleton on what I'm doing. And it really does help a lot. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've got my photographs of this pose off camera that I'm using. It really is nice to have a visual reference to work with. And I thought that that was becoming a, a broken record. So I wasn't gonna say it again tonight, but it is, here we go. It is really nice to get your visual reference and print it out on a piece of paper. This was the cat that I based this sculpture off of. And so at least I've got something to look at to compare and contrast with. And it helps me with the forms and proportions. And so I do, I do urge you guys to find an image or three or four of them and not only find them, but print them out too, if you can. So you've got a hard copy, that way you don't have to keep refreshing your phone every two minutes and you're not getting wax residue all over the glass screen on your phone, because that sucks. And it's even worse when you, your, your old teacher is trying to be hip and cool and says things like sucks because you don't expect that to come out of the mouth of someone as dignified and grizzled as this teacher is. And yet here I am. And here we are doing our thing. But while I've been talking, I've been blasting out this figure and it's really kind of coming together for me. So... I'll probably try to find where breast forms go because when you change the figure in its orientation and space, you're going to wind up changing the location of soft tissue that has to respond to gravity. And so that's going to happen on this sculpture too. A reclining figure will probably have um, on the round form of the rib cage. Rest forms will move a little bit depending on whether an arm is raised or lowered or something. And so we're going to wind up with something different and then things will get welded into place and refined and all of that. And that becomes part of the sculpture. I finally got a model hired for the sculpture class in the afternoons. And so here we are the end of the fourth week of the quarter and tomorrow is going to be the first day that we're actually going to be sculpting from a model in the sculpture class. I'm so pissed and yet at least I'm glad we're someplace with this process and we're going to, you know, start doing that. So COVID, you know, and everything else, the slow moving nature of bureaucracy here at the school, it took forever to be able to hire a person to work with the sculpture class. And it's probably my own damn fault. Yeah, it probably is. All right. Well, uh, we've been at this for like an hour and 20 minutes already. And I think that we're probably going to need to wrap it up just because. So just because we um, sign off on this doesn't mean you should quit. Um, please, you know, put on Netflix or... Um, YouTube or something, or even the radio, even Jefferson Public Radio in the background. So you've got something to keep you um, kind of entertained in the background while you are focused and in flow uh, sculpting. But if you need to move on to other uh, homework, I totally understand. Do try to carve out some time in your week for sculpting though, even if it's Saturday morning or Sunday morning. Wonderful, quiet times to be able to, for a couple of hours, just lose yourself in the sculpture project. And that would be great. Um, I've uh, recorded this. I wanted to remind you guys that I am posting the recorded versions of these things. If there's something actually good that you saw or heard in the um, presentation and need to come back to it, you can fast forward through all the boring stuff to get to the stuff that you like in my presentations. They are at the um, YouTube recordings uh, in e-learning for this class. When you log into e-learning, 
uh, and see all of the stuff over on the left hand side. The YouTube recordings are at the bottom of the list. You can click on that and there are individual links to the YouTube recordings and you just click on each um, title and it'll take you straight into YouTube. Sometimes the YouTube is a better format for downloading and watching video in case your um, internet is a little bit funky and you don't get it really good uh, in the live stream. Um, you might get a better um, experience looking at it as a recording on YouTube. And then of course you can forward through all of the boring stuff. So another, I'm gonna come, yeah. Another helpful thing about YouTube is um, you can speed up the video. So if say you're talking a little too slow, you can have you can just speed up the video to like 0.20 to like a little bit faster and you get a little bit higher up, but then the video goes by a lot quicker. Oh my gosh, I, I've never thought of that before. And now I'm gonna I'm never gonna be able to live this down. I talk too slow and you guys no, want no, me to I'm move. not talking about you. No. Move it along faster, James. Can you move it along a little faster? We can I make you sound like time. you're doing a helium. <laughs> I have to do it with TED Talks because my little ADHD brain cannot handle it if they're talking too slow because I'm like, okay, you said that word four times now. Please just tell me how how important like carbon is, whatever, like whatever the TED Talk is on or how I should be making money off of doing something when I don't want to you know <laughs> yes well i'm impressed that you listen to ted talks so good on you for that that's fantastic and uh, that's a wonderful f corner of the internet to discover if anybody has to discover a corner that's a good one to be in um, they're from my business class so they're not fun they're boring i had to listen to this one guy who thought that being bipolar would make you successful and he's like i he like said, I decided to stop taking my bipolar medication because it made me more successful in business. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Oh, you well. You have to listen to that for a grade. Yeah. <laughs> bipolar know. doesn't make you more successful, but actually the ADHD people, the OCD people are very successful. OCD people, if you are obsessive and compulsive about stuff, that is the drive and the ambition that fuels the world. So if you have you know, a little bit of OCD, that goes a long way. If it's well managed, yes. Otherwise it's super debilitating. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm kind of looking at my mess on my table and I'm kind of cleaning up and scraping up a little bit here. So I'm gonna say good night to you guys and call this to an end. And then I have to sit here for 20 minutes and process this video and post it on YouTube, but they are available for you to look at. So um, I want to thank you guys. Anything else for the good of the order before I get out of here? Yep. Have a good night. Oh, thank you very much. Good, good night, night, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Have a good rest of your week. Bye-bye. You as well.